Jenka, also known as She Hacks Purple. Tanya is the founder of We Hack Purple, an online learning academy, community, and podcast that revolves around teaching everyone to create secure software that just this week announced a new partnership with OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, to provide free access to the Application Security Foundation's Level 1 course on We Hack Purple for all OWASP members. If you're a member, don't miss out. She's also the best-selling author of Alice and Bob Learn Application Security and winner of many awards in her various capacities as a startup founder, pen tester, CISO, AppSec engineer, software developer, speaker, blogger, and streamer. This track is brought to you today by our sponsors, INE, eLearn Security, Axonius, MongoDB, Juniper Networks, CoreLite, Google, We Hack Purple, also seen in this talk, and Bridge Crew by Prisma Cloud. Today, we are super lucky to have Tanya presenting on building security champions at your organization. If you're wondering how a security champions program works, how to select champions, or how to best make use of their enthusiasm once you find them, you're in the right place. This session will teach you how to attract the right people to your program, what and how to train them, how to engage them and turn them into security advocates, what to delegate or not delegate, what to communicate, and how to build an amazing security champion program. Without further ado, here is Tanya Jenka, She Hacks Purple. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Tanya. Um, I'm going to assume you can see my slides. And if you can't see my slides, that you'll tell me because the way PowerPoint works, it covers up the way we're streaming. So I want to talk about building security champions. And the reason that we build security champions is because we want to scale our programs. And also, thank you, Maggie, for introducing me. I forgot to say thank you. OK. so. Basically, we're going to talk about scaling your security team and scaling your program because there are just like there's just not enough people. There's just not enough people to do all of the jobs. Like who here has enough money and enough people and enough tools to do all the things that they wish they could? There's not going to be any hands that go up because <laughs> security teams are vastly outnumbered. Uh, outnumbered. GitHub actually. GitHub just released a, a paper, I think last month, about how security people out, are outnumbered 500 software developers to one, 500. So we can't just work harder, we have to work smarter and we want to scale. That means like be able to do way more things but with the same resources. And that's what we're gonna talk about. We're also gonna talk about what the heck are security champions? What is Tanya even talking about? And how we can build them up. So sometimes um, I've seen places where they're like, you, you were late to the meeting. You have to be the security champion. Guess what? That champion's probably not going to be very good. <laughs> and so we want to talk about better ways to do things. So we're going to talk about a recipe. So we're going to follow this recipe and break this down one by one throughout the talk. And I'm going to repeat it, kind of come back to it. And you'll be totally sick of this recipe by the end. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, oops, wrong button, wrong button. Here we go. Okay, all right. First thing we're gonna do is recruit, then we're gonna engage them. We're gonna teach them. We're gonna talk all about what to teach them and how. We're gonna recognize them amongst their peers, amongst management, and then we're gonna reward them for their awesome work. And lastly, we're gonna keep on doing it. We don't stop. We don't want your program to languish and disappear and evaporate because that happens very easily. So Maggie did, like, in my opinion, a better job of introducing me than this slide. But basically, the idea of these slides, the About Me slide, is to try to show you that we are qualified to give our own talk. But I'm going to just assume that you're like, yeah, she seems fine. I'm willing to sit through this. Awesome. So the problem. So, you know, whenever anyone gives a talk, you have to introduce the problem. And some of you probably super acutely feel this problem and some of you are probably um, maybe like less aware of the problem depending upon what job you have and if you're in management so like the previous uh, so I, I don't know if you saw the previous presentation on this so I was watching and they were great and they were all leaders so all of those amazing women like Ann Johnson um, I'm gonna say InfoSec Sherpa because I follow her online but Tracy etc all of them have led lots of teams and led lots of people. And so they're well aware that there are not enough application security people to go around. Like we have tons and tons of software developers constantly just basically doing amazing things all day, like building things, creating things, designing, architecting, um, debugging, fixing, repairing, et cetera, tons of stuff. And then you have 
you know, one security person for all 500 of them. Also hiring a security person is really, really hard. Hiring them and keeping them is hard. All of those people in the previous panel can definitely tell you that first of all, the marketplace right now demands tons and tons of money for an AppSec professional. They get paid very well. But also just that like, it's just hard to find them and attract them and get them to work with you, especially if you have legacy applications, which lots of us do, lots of software development, like lots of everyone is like, I want to work on the cool, cutting edge, new thing. And so if you have older systems, those probably have more security problems, and it's even harder to attract awesome security people to your team. So to fix this problem, one way that I am suggesting, so there's a bunch of ways that you can work on this problem, but the way I'm going to dive into in this presentation is specifically building a security champions program where you train up lots of people that aren't on the security team to do some of the security jobs for you. And they still do their jobs full time, but on top of their job, they do a bunch of extra things that magically make your job and life way better. So let's talk about scaling your team and your program. So we know there's not enough people, so we have to scale, right? And I thought like working out and lifting weights was a good, a good. The thing about security champions, actually, let me tell you what they are first. So I'm going to read a super professional, formal sounding definition, then I'm going to give you Tanya's definition because that's how I am. So a security champion is a member of a team that takes on the responsibility of acting as the primary advocate for security within that team and acting as the first line of defense for security issues within that team. Meh. So instead, plainly, it is the person that's most excited about security. It's the person that reads the book, that fixes the bug, that asks all the questions every time. That's your champion. And so like, what is, like, what do they do? What, if people are like a security champion, that's a nice word, what does it mean? So this person is your communicator. They deliver security messages to each dev team. They teach, they share knowledge, and they help. This person is your point of contact. So they are your representative on the team. They deliver messages about security. Like they deliver messages back to the security team. Um, they keep you up to date on what matters from a security perspective so that you are ready. And they are your advocate. So they perform security work for their dev team and they help, like they use help from your team, but they also advocate for security. So they are that person that's in the meeting that like you can't make every meeting that's happening across your entire organization, so they are your voice. They are the person saying, you know what? Well, I don't know about this from a security perspective. Like, I think we need to invite a security person to this meeting. Or I learned about threat modeling and I'm seeing this threat and I wanna tell you about it. So a security champion does a lot of stuff that's, in my opinion, very, very valuable. So let's talk about building security champions because um, so they're talking in, in the last session about like, are leaders built or are they born? Well, security champions are definitely built. Um, no one comes out of the womb and they're like, I want, I already know application security. So that's not thing, just the same as no one can come out of the womb and be like, I know how to code. Um, but that's okay, because we can build up someone to be able to do this, especially if they're interested. So again, this is the recipe. And we're going to go just through this over and over again. So we want to find people that are interested and then build them up, build up their skills, build up their confidence, their engagement, their interest, um, and then and then keep doing it. And they will just magically, you know how like bees just go around like gardens and they just like magically pollinate everything, but it, you can help the bees by planting like certain flowers or certain things that make bees want to show up and do their awesome bee magic. It's kind of like that. I garden a lot. Okay, so Back to the recipe, we're going to start up recruiting your champions. So we want to talk about recruiting people. And so the number one rule in recruiting is please don't volunteer someone to be a security champion. So like you're late to the meeting or you're our weakest dev or, you know, we want to punish this person or, um, or we just give it to the senior tech who's super, super busy, who feels that this is just another responsibility they don't have time for. That's not gonna work very well. 
We're not going to get the results we want. Whenever possible, you want to attract the right people instead. So let's talk. So I have a number two rule in recruiting, and then we're going to talk about how to recruit them. So number two is managers have to be on board. So if managers are like, you're wasting my team's time, they're not going to give them time to do the work. And if there's going to be conflict and you want your manager to be happy. So you need approval from top down. I have done it without approval from top down and like slowly, it just went a lot slower. And some teams I couldn't get a champion. And when I had eventually got approval from the top down, it was like off to the races. Life is a lot better. You definitely want managers to be on board and the people aren't secretly doing the work without their manager's knowledge. It's much better that it's all legit and above board. Okay, so let's recruit some people. So like I said, we wanna ask for volunteers instead of appointing people without consent. Consent is really important in all parts of life. Um, we wanna provide opportunities for them to reveal themselves. And so it, this might sound weird. So some people, they don't know they wanna be a security champion. Like, um, and, and some people, it turns out you can strike this passion within them that they didn't know they had and spark this interest. And so ways you can do this, it sounds so silly, but one of my clients, they just changed their email signature to say that they were looking for security champions. They're like, I'm looking for security champions. Is this you? Ask me how. And they found two champions that way. And so I've been advising lots of other people to do it. And it's been very interesting results. People reply to your email. They ask questions. Other ways we can attract volunteers are having lunch and learns or trainings. Anyone that asks questions or attends almost all the events, that person is an awesome potential champion. We wanna use interesting titles for anything we can to attract more people. I remember um, the first presentation I ever did at work, I emailed everyone and I said, I'm gonna break into a bank at lunch. Who wants to watch? And a bunch of people are like, what? And then I, I showed them a vulnerable web app that was a banking web app. And I explained it wasn't a real bank. <laughs> and then I showed them how I got in. And then with that information, showed them how we could protect our apps. And it just got a lot of people kind of curious. And then I got more people at the next presentation. So marketing. Um, and another thing is having a mantra of it's my job to serve you. The devs are my customers. You know, the security team, it's our job to serve you. And when you when you kind of flip it on its head like that, because a lot of security teams are like, you have to do what I say. That doesn't, first of all, like we're all adults and we're like, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want someone to, to just boss me around. Instead, if we say like, listen, it's my job to help you do your job securely. I serve your team. I serve all of the secure, uh, all of the dev teams and I do this by giving you tools. I do this by writing documents. I do this by answering questions and giving the best advice I possibly can by researching things for you. And when you change that wording and your mantra and the way that you talk to devs, that will help you recruit a lot. So now that we have some people that are interested, we're gonna start engaging them. And just so you know, when you start engaging people, that's gonna help you recruit more people. It's kind of awesome. It's like a circular sort of thing where you just keep feeding and finding more people, the more awesome your program is. So let's engage some people. So the word engage can mean to occupy or attract or involve. And so we want to do that with the devs for our like around security activities, but we also wanna do it the other way. So we want to participate or become involved with what they are doing. So if they're doing a project, you know, we want to say, like, do you need help with that? Like, can I come and, you know, do a threat model on your architecture design? Or, you know, do you, can I scan your code? You want to be involved with what they're doing as well. So to engage, I have, a, I, I cut this to only two slides because I'll just be like all day and there are other presentations. <laughs> so one thing you can do is bring them on a software related security incident, assuming that you don't work in a top secret government environment or something like that. You can probably bring them on an incident that has to do with software, especially if it's their software and show them the fire that you are fighting. Um, I went on a security incident and after that I became an incident responder and was totally obsessed with IR. 
share appropriate secrets. Um, I, I once with my boss, so this was my boss's idea and I was dead set against it. And he was like, we have to do this. And he was right and I was wrong. And we brought a bunch of devs in. So we had this one dev team and they did not want to do anything to do with security. They're like, you're wasting our time. And so we had a private meeting with them and we deputized them. We got them to raise their right hand and promise not to tell anyone outside the room about this. And we explained the concept of need to know. And we told them about a huge, awful security incident we had to do with one of their apps. And then another security incident that had to do with leaking employee data by accident or not leaking it. It was that, you know, we had some malware and it might have taken anyway. And we told them about it and how it affected the employees in their personal lives. Well, not specifics, but general, general, generalizations. And so from that day on, they were, they were our warriors. They were amazing. They were like leading the charge. They were so awesome. We want to let all your champions see everything first. If there's a policy, if there's a new tool, if there's changes or information or anything that you're planning, always tell them first. It makes them feel engaged and special because they are special. Um, create a mailing list to tell them about new security stuff. Or if you listen to a podcast and it's actually really, really good and you're like, oh, this is like a security podcast, but it's totally about Node.js and there's these three teams doing that, send them an email and tell them about it. Like all of those things makes them feel engaged and like they matter to you. And it's really important they feel like they matter to you because otherwise you will lose them. Um, I wanna meet with them once a month and have like a list of questions. So like, what are you working on? What are you planning on working on? Do you need any help? You wanna brace yourself for bad news and play it cool. So I have had people tell me about security things and then I freak out and that does not give me the results that I want. <laughs> and so I've learned to remain calm. And when, you know, a dev says, if we encode something twice with base 64, is that like the same as encryption or is that like kind of different? Be cool <laughs> and it'll go better. <laughs> Be cool and calm. Um, so team building events and letting your security champions know each other, that's super cool. A lot of them really appreciate the chance to talk to each other so they can talk about security things with each other. Yes, win. Um, and I like to always invite them to join local um, security communities. So I used to live in Ottawa and we had an amazing, huge, vibrant OWASP chapter. And so I would invite them all the time. I'd be like, hey, we're having a CTF next week. Does anyone want to come? And we actually lived walking or worked walking distance from where the meetings would be. And so a group of us would actually walk together. And that was awesome. So whatever you can do to make them feel engaged. So now teaching what are we going to teach our champions? There is a lot to teach them. Okay. So I feel it's very important to only teach them what they need to know and not teach them more. Oh my gosh. So many companies that I consult with, they're like, oh, well, we're going to give them these advanced network penetration testing course. Oh yeah. Why do they write advanced network security tools? No, they just write web apps. Why are you teaching them that? That is a bunch of crap they don't need to know. And they'll never ever practice as part of their job, which means they'll lose those skills almost immediately. And they're like, well, it's cool. I'm like, did you ask them if they think it's cool? Because they're devs. And they might actually think dev stuff is cool and not hacking stuff. Um, I'm not saying that none of them will think that's awesome. Some places they like it, but I feel it's really important that if you are going to teach them stuff, you teach them only what they need to know because software developers have to know a whole bunch of different programming languages, a bunch of frameworks. They have to know one or more database things. They have to know servers, deployment, all the stuff. Like there's so much stuff they have to know. Don't fill their brains with extra stuff. So what you need from them, what you expect from them and what you want from them as champions is the core to what you need to teach them. So anything they need to know in order to do the things you want them to do, you got to teach it to them. So I'm going to give you three topics and then we're going to drill down on each of those topics of things I think you should teach champions. So secure coding and secure architecture, your policies that affect them. So not like general things like, you know, don't bring your home laptop to work and plug it into our network, but things that specifically involve the devs and tooling. 
So any tools you expect them to know or see the results of, you want to teach them. So for secure coding and architecture, so you can give them formal training on secure coding with labs. You want them to have some hands-on action there. Uh, you want them to te teach them threat modeling, and eventually you want them to be able to do threat modeling themselves. So every time you do a threat model, you want to have one of your champions there if at all possible. Security architecture, so like whiteboarding out what the architecture looks like for the system, asking questions, invite them every time that you can. Code review, so you want them to be able to review their, you want them to be able to review their peers code for potential problems. So like maybe they're the person that approves pull requests, or maybe they just approve some of them, but if you have at least one person on the team being able to spot security problems, that is A plus awesome how to fix security bugs that they find or that you send them. So anything you can do to teach them the common bugs and what to do, that's awesome. And I suggest repeating at least secure coding every single year. Things change, people forget, um, just it's a lot of information. And so every year, and if you happen to be a company that handles um, credit card information, you actually, to be PCI compliant, have to repeat secure coding every year. I realize that that's one of the things that I teach. But as someone that was a dev 17 years before she worked in security, trust me, refreshers are good. Okay, so your policies. So you want them to know which policy standards or guidelines apply to them, and you want them to know them because they're going to talk to other people on their team and you want them to be able to answer questions. And it's like, well, do I really have to use parameterized queries? Yeah, you do. And so if you have them saying that, then you won't have to repeat it 400 times a day like I do. <laughs> um, you want to help them create missing guidelines. So let's say you work at a company and they're just starting to do serverless. So uh, one of my clients that I consult for, they have like one or two serverless apps. Awesome. So we wrote a best practices document for serverless to share with the devs to try to help. We're like, we would really like to see this. We'd like to see that. Um, please, please let us come to a meeting with you for architecture review. Let us do this. Let us do that. And so helping them create any guidelines that are missing. So like, first of all, secure coding guidelines, um, secure design concepts that you want them to implement, API best practices, et cetera. So like we expect if you're using APIs that if they're external facing, they will only be available via an API gateway. This is the API gateway we, we use. These are the settings we desire to see. All you creating this stuff means less mistakes later that you have to clean up. Teach them how to be compliant with all of your policies. So have a workshop about the secure coding guideline and like give them hands-on things. Like the, I, I've had a lot of people say, oh, well, you're a professional trainer, so you're good at making training. But I sucked. I was awful when I started. I was not very good. It took a long time to get good at it. But the devs still came and they still learned. You don't have to be an amazing presenter. Just try your best and just be honest and be open with them and always be open to questions. And if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know, but I will get back to you on that and write it down and get back to them. And like, just those things, people will be engaged. Like people want to learn. Devs want to make awesome software and awesome software is secure software. So like they, trust me, you don't have to be a great presenter. I was a really crappy presenter. <laughs> um, so. You want them to know what their role is during a security incident. This is super important. I want all the devs to know, but if you can't get time with all the devs, just telling the security champions, like, listen, if there's a security incident going on with your app, please don't just go home for the day and not tell us partway through or like bring up pager because apparently it's 1990, but like get their cell phone number or something in case you need information from them, etc. Don't run around and tell all your dev friends, etc. Like what is need to know. I'm a big fan of letting them job shadow me on things they're interested in. So I ask what they want to learn and like for their jobs. And then I let them shadow me. So like, yeah, I'm going to be using this static application security testing tool all day reviewing code in this really ancient legacy app and it's going to be a dumpster fire. Do you want to sit with me for four hours and 
I'm just going to validate results so that they know how to validate their own results. Like, sure. Yeah. Let's, let's have a job shadow session and hold consultations to help them, to let them provide input on policies that will affect them. First of all, you want their super awesome ideas and feedback. Second of all, you want to make them feel valued and heard. So it's always awesome to hold consultations. So next tooling. So custom training on tools that you expect them to use. What does the output mean? How can you validate the results of those tools? How to install and configure those tools? Help them select the best tools. If they're doing a proof of concept, you want to be involved in that. You want to do lunch and learns or hackathons or whatever it is to make sure that they are comfortable with the tools. You want them to be the expert on their team about the security tools. Um, so coaching, a style of teaching. So I believe this kitty's a Jedi. People just don't know. And so I believe that when people coach or mentor other people, that they're, they're truly a, in a class of their own giving knowledge. I have a lot of respect for really senior people that just like share that knowledge down to make sure that they will have a successor. Um, I really, I've, I've been the beneficiary of that many times in my career. And so I, I personally think like mentoring and coaching is extremely important. So coaching means enabling individuals and teams to reach their full potential. Okay. So we want to facilitate them like their needs, their motivation, skills, and processes but basically we want them to make real lasting change. And in this case, we want to put the security bug in their brain so that they can't stop seeing security things. This is what happened with me and then look at me now. Now I do security full time. <laughs> um, if we want teams to start practicing a secure system development life cycle, we need to support them in getting there and that is coaching. And if we want our security champions to constantly reinforce the security team's values and evangelize, we have to coach them and be there for them. And so how can we coach? So besides getting a kitty and then giving it a light, a lifesaver um, for champions, so we can set up office hours. So every Friday, two to four, I have a Zoom meeting open, or if you're in person, you're like, I'm gonna be in my office, I'm not gonna have meetings, come chat me up, because I would love to hear what you have to ask. Set repeat meetings with your champion. So once a month per champion, check in with them, ask them, what are you working on? What are you planning on working on? Do you need any help? Help them prioritize security activities or bugs. Be available to them whenever you can. Help them set goals and then help them achieve those goals. And it might be a learning goal. It might be a bug fixing goal. It might be a, I want, you know, my team manages eight apps and I want this tool in all eight pipelines so I can, you know, master this one part of security. Teach them specific skills or tools that they're interested in and ask them what they need and then provide it. And when you do that, when you do that, you build trust and that's what you want and that's what you need because a security person's eyes can't be everywhere and our tools can't pick everything up and having a dev that believes in security, that understands its importance and really takes that to heart in every meeting, it's amazing. That person will say, oh, what about if this happens? Or, hey, I heard that this framework's more secure than that framework. What about this one? Like just, it's magic them asking a question or making a comment and that dev is their peers. It's not an external person like from the security team coming over and being like, ah, security dogma. It's one of their friends, it's their colleague, it's their teammate. That person's opinion really matters to them. And so us being able to do anything to coach them and help them succeed and be knowledgeable and know the answers is leads to them doing those activities that we need them to do so much. So I wanna have a special note on delegation. So some things should not be the responsibility of the AppSec team. So I, when I first moved to AppSec, did lots of things I should not do because there's not enough of me. There's not enough AppSec people to do all the jobs and I would just get down in the weeds and I was a developer for a long time so I would fix security bugs. No, don't do that. Um, you shouldn't update frameworks, plan releases, like that's their business, it's not your business. Assign bugs to developers, run every single scan, implement, or like the list is endless. And 
not all the security work is your work. And first of all, don't step on the dev's toes, like especially like the dev manager and assigning who does what bug. Mm -mm. Be very cognizant that you're not stepping on their toes or making them feel like you're their parents telling them what to do. Um, another thing, there's some things we should not delegate. So I am a firm believer that we should not make them validate static application security tool results until we've given them training on it. It's really important. I have just seen this in so many places and the devs will just disable the SaaS tool and because they have crap to get done and there's lots of false positives and they're like, it's like it's written in another language that I don't speak. It's really important you give them training before you expect them to do anything like that. Giving security approval on anything, only your team can give approval. Using new tools without proper training, training new champions. We want a partnership. We do not want replacements for our team. So it's really important to give them a limited list of things you expect them to do and then pump them up, train them, give them everything they need to be awesome at those things. And you know these other things are in the AppSec team's realm and that's what we do. So I just wanted, it can be a slippery slope sometimes. So next we want to recognize our champions. It is important to recognize them. We want them to know that they are doing a really good job and we don't want them to feel like they're trapped doing two jobs and only receiving one paycheck. We do not want them to feel like this kitty. So this is, so I, I only have two kitties in this presentation. I felt like that was okay. <laughs> um, but it's really important that they feel good about their efforts, that they feel like we notice, feel like we value them, not only the security team, but the management team that manages them. And so we don't want them to feel like this kitty. So things that we can do. So some of these things you might think, well, they're not in kindergarten, Tanya. They're not gonna, you know, they're, they're not gonna like this. Well, actually all these things totally work on me and I'm definitely an adult by now. So creating a certificate and putting it on their wall that says, I am a security champion. This is like something their peers will see and recognize and be like, oh, cool. That guy's the security guy. I can ask him stuff. Yes. Oh yeah, she's our champ. Awesome. I'm gonna see if she'll look at my design. Yes. You want that person to have their peers know who they are. You wanna recognize them in front of their peers. So a lot of stuff is virtual right now. So you can actually make a custom virtual background that says, I am a security champion. It can have like a bunch of arrows or can have stars or whatever you want. Um, you can put a star next to their name in Teams or Slack or whatever you use for your team chat. There's lots of different ways. Another thing that's really important is you want to put a note in their performance review that says how valuable their input was and their participation was because you want a permanent record that they are awesome. This makes them feel good. It helps them when they're, if you know, you work at a place where there's bonuses or promotions, et cetera, you definitely, definitely want to put a note in their performance review. You want to tell their boss. Every time they do something that's specifically awesome, write the quickest email ever to their boss to say, you know what, Janet was awesome. She told me how her team was doing this thing and she was concerned. And so she invited me to a meeting so I could give them a bunch of different options that were less risky. And if she hadn't brought that to my attention, you know, it could have been like six or eight months before we noticed that. And I just want you to know, Janet totally rules. You want to send them an email and tell them when they did something. You want them to know that you noticed and that you value what they're doing. Um, you want to make their role on their team clear to them and their peers. So again, like that can just be like acknowledging them in a meeting. Um, oh, and this, I don't always think about cybersecurity, but when I do, it's usually too late. The most interesting man in the world should think about cybersecurity more often. Um, so let's talk about rewarding people, right? Like what can we do to reward our champions? So I am a big fan of reinforcing good behavior instead of punishing bad behavior. And so um, I've heard people say like Pavlov's dog, like they would ring a bell, they'd get a tree and you know, it sounds weird, but if we constantly reinforce like good things and recognize good things they do and reward them, they're more likely to keep doing those things. And so not everyone has a budget. So I worked in the Canadian government for a long time and I was not allowed a budget to buy things for people, but 
I kid you not, I would bake cookies and cakes. Uh, I kind of like baking. I'm gluten free, so I often do gluten free baking, but um, but that still tastes good. I'm pretty good at it now. And so I would I would just bake cookies and be like, hey, I'm gonna bring these to the lunch and learn if y'all come to the meeting. And it sounds weird, but that really did it. Another thing I used to do is, so I had security champions and it was their job to scan their app with Zap and fix all the criticals and highs before they sent it to QA and then eventually it got to me. And I, I was like, listen, if you send it to me and there's highs and criticals in the automated scan and Zap, I will come to your desk and make fun of you, which I, I never really did. I, I would go over and be like, hey, so we have some like, and they're like, oh, I ran out of time, but we came up with a reward. And so this is gonna sound really silly, but my reward was a high five. So we worked in this Office 2.0. I hate Office 2.0, just for the record. It's awful. It's so distracting. But for this, it was great. So I remember there was like this senior executive that was talking to my boss. And I, I got an email and I was like, oh, OK. Or no, I, I saw that the scan came up and it was good. And so I was like, oh, just one sec. I'll be right back. And I like run across the floor and I was like, Stefan, you passed the zap. And then I just like really hard and loud. High five all the other devs saw. He has got a high five from the security person. That means he passed his test. And then I just trotted back to my desk and my boss is like, what are you doing? And I said, AppSec. <laughs> and it sounds really silly, but that public recognition in front of all of his peers, Stefan passed every zap. He was great. He was awesome. He became our secure code librarian. That guy ruled. And so positive reinforcement really helps. So things you can do besides high fives, um, security related gifts. So like books, videos, training, CTFs, subscriptions, community subscriptions, like all those things. Awesome. So I like if, you know, they program in Java, hey, here's like five different books that I thought you might like. Would you like to pick one and I'll buy it for you? Because I want to say thank you for your big efforts that you've done. Uh, giving them your time and attention as a reward it took me a long time to realize that, but that is actually a reward. Giving them your undivided attention. So they come to your desk, you turn your body, you face them, you stop whatever else you are doing. It sounds weird, but doing that is a reward. Help them with more than just security. I was a dev forever, so I'm like, yo, want me to help you squash bugs because you have this deadline? Um, it sounds weird, but help them with whatever you can help them with. Let them see everything first, new tools, new policies, etc. Let them help you make decisions, anything you can think of to in, just to make them feel valued. It doesn't have to be a monetary thing, but whatever you do. I remember um, I got to go to a security conference once and uh, I, I got to travel for the first time ever. And I, I had submitted it and I thought for sure my boss was going to say no. And he said, because we worked in the Canadian public service. He's like, I can't give you a bonus, but you are above and beyond everyone else. Like you just, you never stop. You do so many things. And so I can approve your travel to go to this conference that I know you really want to go to. And this can be your bonus. And I was like over the moon. I was so excited. That was way better than getting like 500 bucks for me. Okay, so next, do not stop. Do not stop. Please don't stop. So many companies I see, they like explode with their champions program. They're like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're amazing. Yeah, they they have like three meetings the first month, they have two the next month, then they don't have one for a few months, and then they have one and then they stop and they're exhausted. So don't stop, it's really important. Pace yourselves. This is a marathon, this is not a sprint. So first of all, whenever in doubt, over communicate. If you do not communicate regularly, your program will disappear. Even if you just send out an email and say, hey, it's December. There are a lot of different events happening in December. There's a lot of people taking holidays because there's a bunch of really cool religious things happening. And we are not going to have um, you know, a Security Champions event this month, but we want to say happy holidays to all y'all. And you know, here is a blog article that I read recently that I thought was really cool and I thought I'd share with you. And that's it. And then you wait until January for your next event, but you touched base and that is important. Your program will, it will disappear quickly. I kid you not, I've seen so many programs disappear quickly. So don't let it slip. Consistency is key. 
Even if you just meet with them once a month to check in with them and that's all you do, keep doing it. Some security champions are gonna need a lot more of your time than others. And some will have better performance than others. Some of them will be okay. I, One of my friends, I remember telling me, yeah, I have like 45 security champions and two of them are total dead. They do the bare minimum every time, but you know what? Like 20 are amazing and the other 18 are good. And so my program's awesome. So be aware of that. If you accidentally drop your schedule, pick it up as soon as you can. So like, let's say, um, I don't know, you're sick and you take a month off. When you come back, try to do something, even if it's just sending an email right away to make sure that your champions know you exist, you're there and they still matter to you. Culture is a practice. It must be repeated over and over again. So if you do meditation or you do yoga or you're like, you work out, you go to the gym, you don't just go one time. I remember seeing this meme where someone said, I ate a salad once. I didn't lose any weight. I'm never eating a salad again. And it's so obvious when someone words it that way, but it's the same with security champions. It is a practice that you must choose every day to continue doing. And it doesn't mean you have to talk to them every day, but you have to continue this practice regularly or it will evaporate and it evaporates faster than you think. And I'm stressing this just because I've seen it so many times. So this is the recipe and we did it and we're basically awesome. So I'm going to do a conclusion now, then I'm going to give you a bunch of resources, uh, and then I'm going to take questions. So we see high five. Yeah, that's right. I love high fives. Okay, so conclusion. Um, so what we learned. So we learned how to attract people to your program. And if you've attracted them, that is the right person. We learned a bunch of things about what to teach them and how to teach them, how to engage them and turn them into advocates for security, what to delegate what we should not delegate, how to motivate them. And basically like, in my opinion, how to build an amazing security champion program. Yes. So this was our recipe, um, recruit, engage, teach, recognize, reward, and please don't stop. And so um, I'm pretty sure that a recording of this is gonna be available via the Diana Initiative YouTube page because every year they do that. Um, and so my slides should be on my website in a couple weeks because I'm redoing my shehackspurple.ca website and I'm going to put all my talks, all my slides and a link to videos for everything because I get asked that a lot and I was like, well, why don't I just put it in one place for everyone? Brain. Um, so some resources. So awesome books. So spoiler alert, I wrote Alice and Bob Learn Application Security and me and my mom think it's the best book ever. But I also believe that you can't do security right if you are not doing IT right. And so there's the DevOps handbooks, the Phoenix Project, Accelerate, and the Unicorn Project are all books that I recommend and I think are really good. They're not free. This is free. I have a podcast. Um, so the We Hack Purple podcast, we talk about different careers within security and we meet with really cool guests to ask them questions like, how did you get to where you are today and how can I do it too? Um, and so that's every Thursday live at 6 p.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time on YouTube, or, or you can listen to it later. So there's every podcast platform, and then also like we save them to YouTube. So resources, me. Um, so I have a YouTube channel if you wanna meet. So like once per month for all of 2021, Alice and Bob Learn. Um, so we're having sessions online, live streams, and then recordings after of Alice and Bob, and Basically, like people can learn for free about more than just what's in the book and have a newsletter, blah, blah, blah. So we Hack Purple is sponsoring Diana Initiative. I love Diana Initiative. And we are giving away three free courses until 4 p.m. today. So if you want to sign up for the newsletter directly, you can just go to newsletter.wehackpurple.com and then slash Diana dash initiative dash giveaway or just go to the We Hack Purple booth and um, they'll just sign you up there. They know what they're doing. Um, and I want to wish all of you that you spend your life doing strange things with weird people because that's what makes me happy. And I wanna thank all of you for your time and attention today. Thank you so very much for having me at this amazing community event. I appreciate the entire volunteer team. I appreciate 
full, the organizers who work on this so hard for so long. I appreciate Maggie introducing me. I really appreciate all of you showing up because if you didn't show up, there'd be no point in having this event. So thank you all. Hi, Maggie. Hi, thank you, Tanya. Thank you also again to the audience for coming and joining us for this talk and to the sponsors for supporting the conference. Tanya, you mentioned that you are willing to take some questions now and we do have a little bit of time. Do we have any questions in the chat? I am seeing effusive thanks, a lot of love. Everyone are huge Aww. fans of the We Aww. Hack Purple training materials as well. We got a lot of positive Aww. comments about those throughout. Um, awesome. It Would it be okay if we like, I don't know if you have the power, if we like flashed the address to sign up for the free courses because I want everyone to have a chance. I, I just put it in the private chat. So I think if you like click yeah. a button, you can make it so show up or something. You don't have a good way to flash it on screen, but what oh, I can do that's is okay. put it into the regular chat for everyone else. So that should oh, be perfect. a clickable link to sign up for the We Hack Purple giveaway. Oh, hey, thank you backstage team for hooking us up with that on-screen version of the link. I just want everyone to have a chance and because like my talk is like later in the day, I'm like, oh, I don't want people to miss it. <laughs> yeah, we've been giving away a lot of stuff. You said again, that is until 4 p.m., right? Yeah, then we're gonna close it. And then I think we announce it at the end of the initiative, at the end of Diana initiative, like day one. Four hours you? and 12 minutes left to sign up, everybody. Awesome. So. Any questions or is everyone just like, I'm gonna form a champions program starting right now? I'm assuming no questions means you're all gonna form one starting Monday. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience. So I think everybody out there is feeling confident. Um, do you mind if okay. I step up a little bit of your time and ask a couple of questions? Yes, I would love it. So as you were talking about different kinds of rewards, you mentioned the high fives being really good because they're super public. Do you have like a digital high five equivalent that you like for Slack? Um, so sometimes things I do in Slack are just like, I'll have a certain emoticon that is for the champions. I also do a lot of like the flexing arm muscle thing. I'm, I'm not sure why, but that's like one of my favorite things, but yeah, like publicly acknowledging in, um, the team's channel. So send a message directly for sure to the champion who did the thing, but then putting it in their team chat, just like, I just want to thank this person because they're so awesome. And they did this for me. Um, I, I also, so this is going to sound really silly, but uh, my friend Sean Hooper, who speaks um, a lot at WordPress conferences, he, I remember him sending me this once uh, because we're having a virtual meeting and it's, it's a screen. So it's an image that he full screened and it said, virtual high five, place hand on monitor here. And then we both like put our hand on the screen like this. And he's like, it's the best thing I can get when you're so far away. And I was like, oh, I love it. So sometimes I share that in meetings. I'm like, virtual high five. And it's cheesy, but I am cheesy. And I'm like that all the time. So it fits. You kind of have to find the thing that's your style, if that makes sense. Because if someone is like a really shy, introverted person, they're not going to run up and give high fives publicly. Like that's not how that person is. And so it can feel kind of painful for someone to do something that's against their their, their personality, right? So it's like finding that thing that works for you. And like, I'm wearing like a bright red and blue dress. So like I'm loud as a like personality type. Um, but I know a lot of people are not that way and that's cool. But there's lots of ways that you can recognize people and you can do things in, I don't wanna say sub subversive ways, but ways that are, are more introverted. So for instance, like sending a direct email to their boss, commending them and CCing them on it. And like, that doesn't have to be a big public thing, but it definitely, def I don't know if you've ever had someone do that, but I have had people do that. And definitely um, it made me turn a hundred shades of red, but in the best way where I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Like when I, when I worked at Microsoft, I remember some, like I traveled to another one of our offices and the head of that office sent this wonderful letter to like my boss's boss about how my visit across the ocean was totally worth it because of all these things we achieved together. And I was like, oh my God, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, and then they put in my performance review and then I got a bigger bonus, which was really awesome too. Um, and not expected, that was just like extra awesome, right? But. Yeah, there's ways that you can do things uh, if you're very extroverted or if you're not extroverted, but 
showing people in front of their peers, like recognizing them in front of their peers, like that feels good for everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. While you were answering my question, a couple of audience members submitted their questions as well. First up, cool. we have a question from Angelica. How can we help our security team be a bit friendlier? Most of their engagement is from a compliance standpoint, and it scares a lot of the non-technical staff. Oh my gosh, Angelica, you speak my language. Yes. So how can you help the security team be friendlier? So it depends on if you are on the security team or if you are on the dev team. So when I was a dev, we had the security team, the last place where I just wrote code full time, um, they, the security team, we called them the department of no. They would come to meetings and just say no all the time. And so when they started coming to meetings, so they would always say, no, you can't do that. And I'd be like, what can I do? And they'd be like, you're a dev, figure it out. If you were good at it, you would know. And so I told my manager and I told their manager, like, they're not fun to work with. Like, like you can say no to me. You can say, no, that's not a safe way to do it, but you can't say no. And I'm going to give you zero options that work. I'm just going to like crap on your baby. I'm like, cause these apps are my babies. All the apps that my team make, those are my babies too. And they're telling me my babies are ugly in every meeting. And they're like, your baby's ugly and I have no idea how to make it not ugly. So then I'm going to be insecure at you. And I was like, I don't, I don't want them speaking to my staff anymore because they just make them feel bad. So only talk to me. So we'd have meetings and I'd be like, hi, doctor. No. And they're like, you know, that's rude. I'm like, do you think your behavior is not rude? I'm like, you need attitude adjustment. And so their boss gave them all like a big talk about attitude adjustments and they weren't allowed saying the word no all the time. And so they would come to me and they're like, I'm not allowed saying just no. I have to say, no, you can't do that. But, and then I have to give you solutions. And sometimes I don't know the answers. So we will, so we started having brainstorming sessions. And sometimes it would just mean that, like, I remember one of them just gave me the Microsoft Secure SDLC book, which is this thick. And I remember them dropping it on my desk and it being heavy and making like this boom sound. And they're like, there, then you can know security. And I was like, okay. So it took like a while to kind of like warm them up of just saying like, you want me to get this work done? You have to work with me. And so tell them if they're just gonna say no, that that's not good enough. They're like, their job is security. Help me figure out the security thing. And so at first, like they had started with shaming me, like, well, if you were a good dev, you would know. But by that three and a half years, by the time I quit, they're like, okay, Tanya, so your team's doing this thing and we don't like it. I'm like, okay, so what are we going to do instead? And he's like, okay, so I have some options. And gosh, it was so much better. And we stopped calling them Dr. No and started calling them by their names and relations just got better and better and better. So when I moved to the next company again, I had to like kind of build that bridge. And that's why I became the AppSec person because I am the bridge now. But yeah, it's a lot of like telling them that their behavior, like how it made me feel. And they're just like, and, and it's weird also being like usually the only woman on every team Right. And so they're like, oh, the women wants to talk about her feelings. I'm like, yeah, and you're going to sit down and listen because I'm the tech lead. Shh. <laughs> I'm like, you're making my devs feel bad. My devs don't want to come to meetings with you. That's not acceptable for me. You cannot be mean to my team. I am their mama bear. I will protect them. <laughs> that is a great answer. And you actually also covered the other question we had in the chat. Which is extra great because we are at time. Thank you again, okay. Tanya for all of this excellent advice and inspiration on building security champions programs for all of our companies. Hopefully everybody is now ready to go out and do that. Don't forget to sign up for the Diana Initiative giveaway on wehackpurple.com. You can also find that link after we finish in the expo booth where you can also find all of our other sponsors. Go ahead and see them in person if you've got some free time. Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Maggie. So nice to see you again. So Bye, nice everyone. to see you again, too.